Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the webinar on communicating uncertainty in statistics and analysis. Um, certain, webin uh, certain webinars are organizing um, by the best practice and impact division. I'm going to talk about a little bit what we're doing in BPI. The best practice um, and impact division is a service for all those who work with uh, government statistics. The division brings together the good practice team, quality center, harmonization team, methodology advisory committee, and methodology advisory service. We work with statisticians and others across government uh, to improve government statistics through advice, consultancy, training, guidance, and champion networks. Um, BPI works to identify best practice across government, the private sector, and internationally, and shares the best practice across the GSS. Um, what are the setting webinars? Uh, we use themes and processes identified at innovation seminars and through our champion networks. Um, the idea behind the setting webinars is to enable us to work together and learn from each other. We are open to any suggestions on topics, so feel free to share any idea with us for any future um, webinars. Uh, a little bit about the agenda. Um, each presentation is going to last about 15-20 minutes and then we're going to have about 5 uh, to 10 minutes for questions. For questions, you need um, to use Slido with the code uncertainty, but please, feel, uh, please also use Slido and let us know if you're having any technical difficulties or you can hear us. Um, for today, uh, the presentations for today, uh, we have um, Charles Land from the Best Practice and Impact Division, who's going to talk about communicating quality, uncertainty, and change. Catherine Blair from North Alliance, from NISRA um, is going to talk about um, communicating uncertainty in labor market statistics. Dr. Sarah Dryhars from Winton Center is going to give a presentation on communicating uncertainty around trends over time. And finally, tech, uh, John Tequin from Department for Education. Um, it's going to talk about the uncertainty toolkit. I'm going to hand over to Charles. Okay, thanks, Nikki. Um, hopefully, you can hear me. I'm going to now going to share my screen. There we go. I can do that. Um, I'll share an entire screen. You can see I'm super expert at this. There we go. We'll probably find these things are quite slow to share. It says I'm presenting to everyone. Can anyone, Nikki, can you see my screen now? Yes, I can see your screen. Uh, cool. Okay. So thanks. I'm going to be talking about um, some guidance um, from the from best practice and impact BPI um, on communicating quality, uncertainty, and change. Um, this is has been evolving over time. It used to be just uh, communicating uncertainty and change, and we brought in quality. So all aspects of stats quality, um, um, as well as uncertainty and change. Um, here is the guidance. Um, you can look at it on the GSS website. Um, I think we can probably find that. Um, we brought out this version of the guidance in December 2018, um, and we're about to update it. Um, I think we've just got a version that's ready to go uh, for updating. When we brought out this version, we were really pleased to see David Spiegelhelt, who I think many of you will be familiar with, um, gave this really nice complimentary remark uh, as soon as it came out. Excellent new guidance on the GSS on communicating uncertainty and change. Really nice to see then that. Um, a little bit later, a bit more kind of um, follow-up from Professor Spiegelhalter um, on some of the work that the Winton Centre are doing. Um, we've collected together 10 documents over 22 years from UK government departments giving guidance on risk assessment and communication. And then this slightly kind of gnomic remark, all rather good appearing every few years and then largely ignored and forgotten. 
institutional memory of a goldfish with a nice picture of a goldfish. Um, we weren't quite sure what to make of this institutional memory of a goldfish. I think there's two points here. Um, one is that um, we can issue the guidance um, and do the training, but there's an ongoing task to keep this going all the time um, to update the training, uh, to update the awareness. Um, it's not enough to just publish and kind of go away. So I need that kind of sticky change to happen. Another point around this is that there are different views about how to make this work well. Um, some people will say, and we get this from the Office for Statistics Regulation, there should be more information on uncertainty. Um, we get a bit of pushback from digital publishing saying, well, you know, stick to the main facts. If we put in too much supporting information, um, people won't read it. So we need to keep our bulletins short and snappy, um, while at the same time including information about uncertainty. So if we go into our guidance, um, we see this. Um, this is in the uh, initial section on what's this guidance for. Um, so this is still presenting, yeah. um, uncertainty is an inherent aspect of statistics, but the term is often misinterpreted, possibly implying that statistics are unusable or simply wrong, and we don't want that to be the case. And we have actually chosen to use uncertainty here rather than something more technical like statistical error. So it's important that we get the terminology right and be as helpful as we can. Um, if we imply that the stats are unusable or simply wrong, um, we may have the concern that pointing out limitations in the, st <coughs> in the statistics could reduce users' confidence in the published figures. Oh, okay. I'm seeing that people aren't getting access to the stream yet. That may be because of a delay on the streaming process. Okay, perhaps I'd best just press on. Yeah, Charles, if you okay, could carry thanks. on as usual for now. Um, the, the problem is just departmental IT restrictions. I'm just um, trying to help this. Okay, I'll, I'll press on regardless, um, maybe talking into the void. Okay, so as I was saying, uh, we try to talk about uncertainty. Um, there's this concern that us as producers um, might be wor worried that if we point out limitations in statistics, that they could reduce users' confidence in the published figures. But we assert in our guidance that this should not be the case. So we should be able to talk about the limitations, the uncertainty in the stats, but still re <clears throat> retain that confidence of our users. Okay, so there's the challenge. We're going to help in our guidance and what I'm saying here, give you some examples um, on how to make this work well. I'm going to start actually with um, a characterization of what we often see is that um, people talk about the limitations of the stats and say care should be taken when using these statistics, full stop. That's not very helpful. If you just say care should be taken, it leaves the users feeling, well, these are somewhat um, difficult or dangerous statistics to use. And the worst thing is that they might go elsewhere. And it may be they'll go to other statistics which are actually um, worse, but people haven't pointed out the limitations. So we want people to still use our statistics, um, but, be, but but to know when to use them and how to use them. So how can we be more helpful? Well, when we do the, this um, as a training course, we give examples. We give examples and I put them into four categories here. Four categories I use, and you can cut these other ways. You could you could characterize the the advice we give in different ways but what we've we've got here is showing the process so you could tell people how did you get the data that underlie these statistics and by showing them the process it can be a bit prosaic um, but it should be helpful to give a sense of um, how to use these statistics you can describe the uncertainty you can give confidence intervals perhaps say something about the coverage of the statistics um, 
but describe the uncertainty to help people. As you go down, perhaps you get a bit more helpful. You can illustrate the uncertainty. A chart often makes volatility in the statistics really obvious. Um, and a picture paints a thousand words. And then at the bottom there, tell them what you can and can't do with the statistics. And perhaps um, I should rephrase that as tell them what the statistics can and can't tell you. What are the statistics saying and what are they not saying? And as you go down this continuum, I think you're getting more helpful. So it's this stuff at the bottom. What you can you and can you not say about these statistics that is the most helpful? And what are the statistics saying about this? society in the economy. So here's some examples. First one, showing the process. So I've looked at a, a recent publication, the infection survey pilot, quite high profile stuff, produced very urgently, um, produced very quickly by the ONS. And you can see right up front, and this is in the this is in the headlines. They're actually showing the process because they're saying of the 20,000 participants, about 21 individuals, 21 individuals out of the 20,000 tested positive for COVID-19. Now that shows me the process. It says the way we're going to talk about the level of infection in society is through a test. That test isn't perfect. So this isn't quite the same as saying this percentage of people have got COVID-19 currently. It's saying how many tested positive. So we're showing the process. It also shows me that if you've only found 21 individuals testing positive, it's unlikely that you're going to be able to give me at this stage a regional breakdown or a breakdown by the type of job that those people are doing or their circumstances because you only found 21 people testing positive. Just following on from that, ONS here say these figures do not include people staying in hospital and they do not include people staying in care homes. So it's a household survey. Therefore, those people are excluded. And we know that's important to you because the rates of infection are likely to be different in those settings. So two examples from one publication there where ONS has shown the process um, which helps to interpret the statistics. Next up, oh, need to ignore that. Next up, um, an estimated 39,000 new COVID infections. This is going back to the beginning of June. And straight away in that bullet point, a 95% confidence interval. Now, that's quite unusual for ONS. Um, if you look at the ONS kind of style guide for bulletins, we try to keep the number of words in these headline bullets down to as few as possible. And that usually precludes including things like confidence intervals, but we have put that in here. Perhaps we saw it as being particularly important to get that, that uncertainty in the in the headline there. So we're describing the uncertainty there. The third example that I found from a, a recent publication, I think again, this is from the COVID infection, infection study. So lots of good examples in there is illustrating the uncertainty. Here they've illustrated the uncertainty by showing this downward trend. And you can see from this line that actually this is quite stable, stable downward trend. There's not a lot of volatility. If this line were jumping around up and down like this, we'd have a much, we'd have a completely different impression um, of the uncertainty. So a picture really does help to show the uncertainty. Inclu included in this, we've got these confidence bands around the outside and a useful annotation here. The 95% credible intervals. Um, this makes me slightly worry as a statistician because this publication includes both confidence interval, <coughs> confidence intervals and credible intervals. Would we be confusing people with those? We haven't actually seen much pushback. I haven't seen much reporting of people saying, well, they were getting confused because those are both in there. Um, this picture also includes a nice title, which shows, um, which actually announces what the the, um, the graph is, is saying, that there's a, a downward trend and that it is statistically significant. So therefore, the user kind of comes away knowing what the main story is uh, and what you can say because it's all packaged up 
um, with the picture. And if you were to actually cut out this picture, put it in a tweet, the whole story is there, plus the information about uncertainty in one self-contained picture. And finally, I said the most helpful you can be is to tell them what you can and can't do with these stats. Um, and here, here's an example. One thing you can do with these stats is you can make a statement to say a higher percentage of individuals who report working in patient facing roles in health and social care tested positive for COVID-19. So you can come away and you can make that statement. They, they can use that statement in the press because we're confident that that is a valid statement from these statistics. So we're helping people to make that statement. We're helping people to avoid making statements in which they would compare um, the statistics for these 14 day time periods with the ones in the previous publication, because that wouldn't be a valid comparison. So we're telling people what they can and can't do with these statistics. I've got a second example of this. Um, you may have seen recent GDP figures showing that I think in March, I may not be quite right, I think it was in March, that um, the economy shrunk by 20% uh, after having shrunk by 5% the previous month. There is some help getting some more up-to-date information. And if you look in these economic activity faster indicators, I thought these were leading indicators of GDP. But actually, if you go to the bulletin, it says these are not intended to be an early measure of GDP. These are not intended to be an early measure of GDP. So I would have been wrong if they hadn't informed me about this. Okay. But what they say is what you can say from these is that they give an early picture of a range of activities that are likely to have an impact on the economy. So not an early indicator of GDP, but showing some pressures on GDP. So what you can and can't say about these statistics. So I've gone through those quite quickly. Um, I'm quite pleased to see that ONS there has given, given me four, five clear examples of where we've been showing the process, describing the uncertainty, illustrating the uncertainty, and telling people what you can and can't do with these statistics. So kind of challenge back to us is, does this work? Does this work? Uh, OK. OK, does this work? Um, what I'd like you to do is, if you're looking at the stream, and I hope some people are, I'd like you to look at the link that I put in the stream, OK, in the discussion. So I'll try and send that again. Um, you should see a, a, a link to a YouTube video, um, which is about a minute long. So if you could look at that now. OK, if you have had the opportunity to look at that video, um, what you will have seen is, just click on to the next screen. No, it's next screen. If you click on to the next screen. Um, so going back to the beginning, we were concerned that pointing out limitations in the, in the statistics could reduce users' confidence in the published figures. What we've seen here is three users of statistics, Prime Minister, Secretary of State for 
Department of Health and Social, um, and Social Care um, and the Deputy Chief Scientific Officer, I think, all using these statistics. Um, in the first one, the Prime Minister said that the R value is between 0.5 and 0.9. And we also saw this rather nice kind of graphic with the R value hovering between those two values. And he said that it's potentially only just below one. So there we've got the actual the Prime Minister using statistics with the associated uncertainty, but still apparently using them with confidence. The Secretary of State, Matt Hancock, um, was talking about this um, volatility in the number of deaths by day and pointing out that oops, pointing out that there's these lower points here but if we look at the seven day rolling average you can still see that that is falling um, and giving us we can say that the overall rate of deaths does appear to be falling because of the seven day rolling average and the third example pointing out showing the process based on on a survey of households uh, with a sample size there that these are estimates um, and that this figure here of 148,000 actually comes with a confidence interval as attached. Okay, so that's it. That's my presentation on communicating quality, uncertainty and change and our guidance there. Um, and very much welcome feedback on that. Um, and so we don't have this memory of the goldfish. We can actually update, um, continue to have um, a, a positive impact on how we communicate uncertainty and change. Thanks. Um, there are Hi, people struggling to get on higher. Um, there are a couple yeah, of questions that I'll just pose to you about the presentation before we figure out what to do next. Um, so is it recommended, this is from Shannon, is it recommended to also provide an explanation of CI is and what a 95% level means for users who don't understand this explanation of uncertainty? Yeah, I, it, it, it certainly is. I, it is, I would recommend providing an explanation. Um, we wrestle with this because, um, well, for a start in the um, COVID study, we actually included an explanation which was wrong, which was a bit embarrassing, but um, uh, we, we, which was technically a bit wrong. And that caused a bit of a, a flurry on Twitter. So you have to be careful about that. Um, I, th from, I would say that it's OK in the headline to just include the interval or just a, an indication that it is an interval. Um, because I think most people can work with that as a kind of um, margin of error or some idea, of, a, a vague idea of uncertainty. Um, but then you should definitely include in your notes a more kind of detailed description of what a confidence interval or a credible interval is so that people have the, that technically correct in the notes. So I think you're talking about two different audiences, one that's going to look at the headline who wants a very short description Oh, yes, it's something about margin of uncertainty. And then somebody who might go, actually, I want to just check what they're doing there in that modeling. I want to check in a bit more detail. So, yeah, the answer is yes. <laughs> Great. Um, there's another comment here that says, better to scale up to whole people per capita. Do you, um... Do you know which one was that, um, which, mm. which point that was on? No, no I'm not. afraid not. I can't see when it was. Um, but that's perhaps something we can pick up. Better to scale up to the uh, per capita. Yeah, I mean, I guess that might be around the numbers of people who are catching um, the infection um, in the two week period or the number who've had it so far or, or, or how many are infected in the community. Um, it, I think the per capita, there's two things. So there's, there's um, the absolute numbers and totals, which are perhaps talking about the um, the burden and the efforts that is required for things like track and trace or the burden on the the NHS um, on critical care so perhaps the the numbers are most important there because that's how much stuff you got to buy how many people um, you need to um, hire to cover that um, the rate the per capita rate is perhaps um, more instructive for the population in terms of 
you know, what's the impact? What's the lived um, experience of, of COVID-19 or unemployment or whatever you're talking about? Um, that's perhaps best expressed as a rate. So, yeah, the total numbers and the rate are both important, um, perhaps for different uses. So we've got a couple of questions here about credible intervals. So I've not heard ah, of one good. before. Are you able to explain and um, what is a credible interval relative to a confidence interval? OK, um, what's hidden there is um, fundamentally different approaches to doing the analysis. Um, and so there's a real risk here that we can confuse. Um, confidence interval comes from a, a traditional frequentist background where we're saying that um, the uncertainty comes from um, the random sampling. Um, so the traditional kind of confidence interval where uh, we create a confidence interval and we'd expect that to contain the true value if we were to rerun the random sample many times. A credible interval comes from um, a Bayesian approach to the modeling that you saw. So the, um, the line graph you saw there with the decreasing prevalence was from some modeling. It's from a Bayesian approach where the credible interval, um, I may get this wrong, but the credible interval has a certain probability of including the true value. Now to the lay user, um, if I have got it right, to the lay user, those two things are going to sound identical. So we have got a bit of a problem that we're introducing some technical terminology, um, which um, may well confuse. I think probably in the headlines, we could probably still just call them uh, a margin of error or an interval and ask people who are interested in the details to go to the kind of supporting information. Um, so for most of the lay users, they're going to look very similar. That's it. Does that, that answer the question? Thanks, what do you, do you think? Um, I think so. I think that's all the questions we've had for that presentation. Okay. Um, that was great. Thank you. I'll pass over to Nikki now. Hopefully she's there to um, introduce the next presenter. And I'll stop presenting. I can't hear you yet, Nikki. Are you switched on? I think Nikki might still be away, um, but we've had a, we've had some issues with people joining. But I think a lot of people have been able to get on. Oh, sorry, Charles. There is actually one more question for you. Okay. Um, perhaps the goldfish analogy means that the ONS doesn't consistently report uncertainty in a meaningful way between guidance publishing. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think um, I probably didn't express this well enough. I think we can be criticised of. Um, there's actually um, kind of uh, there's some circularity in that we 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 perhaps have you know a go at this and we take support from people like um, the Winton team. Sarah's going to be speaking later, and we and we you know we improve what how we present uncertainty, and then you'll get a kind of um, a little bit of pushback um, perhaps from our publishing colleagues who want to trim things down. Uh, make things a bit more snappy. So there's this constant kind of tension of more and less information um, and trying to make things clearer. Hopefully we improve gradually over time. But yeah, I don't think we I don't think we do get it get it right consistently. We want to improve, not be goldfish. Great, thank you. Thanks, Louise. Um, okay. Um, I'll pass on to Catherine now from NISRA to talk about communicating uncertainty in labour market statistics. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you. Um, and just if you can confirm that you can hear me okay? Yep. Great. Yes, I can. Thank you. Um, I'm Catherine Blair from NISRA, which is the Northern Ireland Statistics and Research Agency. And I'm going to share our experience of communicating uncertainty in regional labour market statistics. Um, 
And at this early stage, I'd like to say that we have benefited from the training from the good practice team and from the user guide that you've produced. And we look forward to the next update of that user guide. So I'm going to discuss how we have communicated the uncertainty, firstly by setting the scene, giving you a bit of background information on our main data sources and the level of variability within it. I'll then discuss some of our main challenges that we've faced and how we've tried to address those. And um, that will also include some recent challenges in terms of um, communicating any issues that have arisen due to the coronavirus pandemic and the change in data processing and data collection due to the coronavirus pandemic. And then I'll conclude by discussing some of our next steps. In NISRA, we publish um, a wide range of labour market statistics each month. And these statistics come from a range of data sources from business surveys, household surveys, and administrative data. But I'm going to focus on the data that comes from the Labour Force Survey. The Labour Force Survey is the largest regular household survey in the UK. And it's a quarterly survey of approximately 40,000 households. The data from the Labour Force Survey is used to produce the headline estimates for the UK of employment, unemployment and economic inactivity. And while users are interested in the most up to date figure for employment, unemployment and economic inactivity, they're also interested in the change over time. And in particular, the quarterly change and the annual change in the figures. In Northern Ireland, the sample size for the Labour Force Survey is 4,000 selected households. And that results in an achieved sample size of over 5,000 individuals aged 16 and over. And it's this achieved sample that we produce our statistics on. In terms of the results, to give you a bit of a flavour of what we're dealing with, the results from the Labour Force Survey for January to March this year are in the table. And um, in the table, I've presented the estimate for each of the three headline rates, as well as the 95% confidence interval around the estimate. So looking at the employment rate for Northern Ireland, it was estimated at 72.4%. With a 95% confidence interval of plus or minus 1.6 percentage points around that estimate. And the size of that confidence interval for the Northern Ireland estimate is broadly comparable to the size of the confidence intervals around the other UK regional estimates, which um, for the same time period ranged from plus or minus 1.1 percentage points to plus or minus 2.1 percentage points in different regions. So at 1.6, we're, we're broadly comparable there in the middle. Now, the UK estimate, obviously, with its much larger sample size, has a smaller confidence interval around the headline estimate of employment. So for the same period there, the UK uh, figure was 76.6%, with a 95% confidence interval of plus or minus 0.4 percentage points. So at this stage, you can see that the level of variability in the Northern Ireland results is a lot greater than the level of variability in the UK results. And so that presents a challenge for us um, in communicating the statistics and the uncertainty around them. So this graph further shows the difference in the level of variability. This is the Labour Force Survey employment rate for a 15 year time trend for the UK in Navy and Northern Ireland in green. And a number of things are, are notable from the graph. You can see that the Northern Ireland um, trend is very similar to the UK trend, albeit a number of percentage points below the UK estimate. But more notably, you can see the difference in the level of variability. So you can see how the figures are, are um, varying. And not all of these figures or not all of these changes will be statistically significant and it is our challenge as statisticians to communicate 
first the, the level of uncertainty around the figures and the variability and to separate out crucially the real change in the data for users. So it's our challenge to fully explain the uncertainty around the estimates and the change over time within our main report and our press releases where we have space to do it. But it's also our challenge to fairly present the estimates and the uncertainty around them on social media where we have less space to do so. And I'll just discuss how we have tried to address this in the next few slides. And also more recently, it's been a challenge for us to make users aware of the change in our process in terms of data collection or statistical processing due to the coronavirus um, pandemic. And then also explain to users the impact that has on the quality of the statistics or the uncertainty around them. So how do we communicate this uncertainty within our report? Our main report is the labour market report and we publish this each month and it contains a range of statistics. And like many national statistics publications, it is a mixture of text, tables and charts and um, with a, a fairly large um, further information section at the back. And we try to communicate uncertainty throughout the publication, mostly by discussing statistical significance or confidence intervals. So this is the front page of our publication and um, a number of users won't get past the front page. They'll get all the key points from the front page and won't read the more detail within the publication. So right from the outset, we are very keen to make sure that we are paying particular attention to the language that we're using um, so that we're not presenting the results in absolute terms, but as estimates. So the first thing on the left there, we say um, we're clear to um, users that it's a survey source and it's estimates. And on the right there, the words that we use is the latest estimates from the labour force survey indicate. So we're making clear that it's a survey source and that the estimates are derived from the survey source. Secondly, when we're discussing our quarterly and annual changes, we're clear to include whether they are statistically significant or not. And we recognize that not all users will understand the terminology. So we try to qualify what that statement means. And we do that in really two parts there on the right hand side. So we say firstly, that where there is a statistically significant change, the estimated change exceeded the sampling variability expected from a sample survey of this size, which um, some users will understand. And then secondly, we say, and it is likely to reflect real change. And we feel that that second part of the sentence is more likely to be understood by a larger amount of people. We also provide information on um, longer term statistically significant changes, so not just the quarterly and annual changes, to set the changes in context of a longer time trend. So an example there that we've used on the right is, we would say, although recent changes were not statistically significant, the employment rate is significantly above rates in 2018. Within our tables, um, they're presented in quite a standard way. And we provide information on the estimate for unemployment, employment, and economic inactivity alongside their rates. And below that, we provide the 95% confidence interval. We also provide the estimate of the change over the quarter and the change over the year, which our users are interested in. And alongside that, we provide the 95% confidence interval around the change. So again, trying to highlight that what we're looking at are estimates of the unemployment rate and also the difference between two estimates is an estimate itself, which has a confidence interval around it. Within the main body of our report, we have um, more space to expand on each of the different labour market statuses. And this page shows us um, a chapter on unemployment. So right from the start of this chapter, we include some information on the labour force survey, again, making it clear to people that the 
um, estimates are coming from a survey source and we provide some background information on the labour force survey. We are clear that the estimates are subject to sampling error and we um, further signpost the users to the back of our publication in the further information section and also a further paper explaining it. We include a graph, um, as the previous presenter said, a picture paints, paints a thousand words. And this graph shows a 15 year time trend of the Northern Ireland unemployment rate and the UK unemployment rate. And again, looking at this, users can see quite clearly the level of variability in the results. And they can judge the difference in the most recent quarterly and annual changes compared to the rest of the time trend. And then at the bottom of the page, we provide more detail and more commentary on the most recent estimates and changes. And we also cover longer term trends, all really to try and put the information in context. Although in our main report, we've included information on confidence intervals and sampling variability and statistical significance, we felt that we maybe hadn't expanded on it entirely within the report. And similar to the previous presenter, we weren't sure if it was the right place to fully um, expand on the details within the report. So last year, we published a separate user guide estimating and reporting uncertainty that was to be used alongside the labour market report. And it contains answers to a lot of the questions we were getting from users. And we hope we have answered them by using a series of work examples that can be used in conjunction with the labour market report. So the report and the user guide refer to the publication that deals with the data from March to May 2019. And it explains um, what you can do with the confidence intervals, how you can use them in terms of um, deciding on how precise an estimate is. And um, we've spelled out what a confidence interval is there at the bottom. Within the publication or within the user guide, we provide um, examples of the tables from the report. And then we highlight where the confidence intervals are and again, how that can be interpreted. And we also provide more detail on what statistical significance means. And then for more technical users, we include a page that shows how we calculate the standard error around the quarterly change and the confidence interval. And then we provide a worked example using the data from the labour market report on that. So with our main report and the user guide, we had the luxury of the space to fully explore the different concepts. But on social media, we're very restricted in space. And we have found it a challenge to balance the need for a short message on social media, with also the need to fairly represent the estimates and communicate the uncertainty around the estimate. And we have been refining how we do this over a number of years. And the model that we have settled on is one where we have an infographic in the main body of the tweet. And we focus solely on the estimate, the point in time estimate, the most recent estimate. And we don't refer to the change or whether the change was statistically significant within that infographic. However, in the text around the tweet, we do, um, in the text around the tweet, we do include, include detail on the quarterly and annual changes and whether they were statistically significant. And we also squeeze in with some really careful editing, um, some detail on longer term statistically significant changes and provide a link back to the main labour market report. So as I say, we've refined this over time and uh, no doubt we'll continue to refine, refine how we do this. The final challenge I wanted to briefly touch on was the most recent challenge presented by coronavirus and the impact on the collection of statistics. 
So in our report, in our things users need to know section, which is at the beginning of the report, we have included detail on how we have suspended all face-to-face -face household interviews um, from the middle of March due to the coronavirus pandemic. And then in the last paragraph there, we have provided some information on what that impact has been on the sample size, and it's been uh, made the sample size decrease in size. And then we've also provided some information on how that has impacted the precision of the estimates. And um, in the text there, you can see that it has a, had a marginal impact on the precision at this stage. And the um, confidence, the 95% confidence interval around the employment rate has increased uh, by 0.1 percentage points. So we will continue to monitor this and we will continue to communicate the impacts of the change in data collection to the precision of the estimates. So hopefully I've explained some of the main challenges that we have faced and how we've tried to address these. And there are at least two challenges that still remain on our radar in terms of communicating uncertainty. The first one um, arises from time to time, and it is how to communicate marginal results. And by marginal results, I mean changes in the estimates. So, so for example, a change in the employment rate over the quarter that isn't statistically significant, but is very close to being statistically significant. And the question is, how should we communicate these? And should we communicate this differently to other statistics? And I look forward to the next presentation, which might help um, us decide on how we progress this. This challenge, which we hope to deal with in the coming months, is to implement the recommendations set out by the Office for Statistics Regulation in their recent compliance check of labour market statistics in Northern Ireland and in the devolved, other devolved administrations. And to meet these uh, recommendations, we will be including some sampling variability for the UK estimates within our release. And we will ensure that we communicate the uncertainty around any changes in the um, quarterly and annual estimates of the UK employment rate, unemployment rate and inactivity rates. And also then when we're referring to the difference between Northern Ireland estimates and UK estimates, we'll be sure to include the uncertainty around those. So hopefully I've given you some insight into the challenges we've faced in, in communicating uncertainty in regional labour market statistics and I'm happy to take any suggestions or questions you might have. Hey Catherine, sorry, I read you a question and I was on mute. Um, so the question is, um, we talked about statistical significance, but this is dependent on the significance level. How should we communicate that this isn't a black and white issue? Yes, I, I think that's a very good question and it, that I often debate. And um, I think that's really what my main challenge is in terms of communicating marginal results. And I um, don't have the answer today on that, but it is something we want to explore. And I think in our user guide, we need to explain more about the fact that this isn't a black and white nature of significant or insignificant. It's, it's a, um, a spectrum. And I think once we crack how to um, communicate the marginal results, we will also better be able to communicate this nature as you describe it, that it's it's not um, a, a binary um, statistically significant or not. So um, I'm hoping that the next presenter might have some ideas on that. Um, another question, how long does it take to produce the infographics that go with your tweets? Um, how can you send tweets in a timely manner? Um, 
My team produced the um, infographics at the same time as we are publishing the results. And typically we use the same template um, in, in those templates. And so once the template has been set up, it's a matter of um, updating the text. So I think there was a, a, a certain amount of time that was taken to set up the template, but it's relatively short now that we have established the, the template. We do produce, for example, last month, um, videos that go alongside the report um, to communicate the results and they do take longer. So I think we've got it into a, a relatively short period of time to update those um, tweets now that the template has been set up. Okay, great. Um, Another question, how do you communicate the significance level you use? Do you choose 95%? Yes, um, we choose the 95% levels and we include in the report that it's a 95% uh, confidence interval around the point estimates, but um, in the report we don't say in the main body of it, um, at least that it's a um, what the level of significance is. Um, and I think we do at the back of our report, but certainly not in the main body of it. And really that is the challenge. How much detail do, do we and can we give when communicating the headline results? Or should we expand it in the um, user guide that goes alongside it? Brill, thank you, Catherine. I think that's all the questions that we've got for you. Um, thank you. So, I'll, thank you. I'll pass over to Sarah now. Um, she's going to talk about communicating uncertainty around trends over time. Hi, everyone. I'll just um, get my screen share going. See. So you'll be able to see some of the papers that I'm reading at the moment. I'll just stop my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> They're very interesting. Um, it, can you see that okay? You can hear me. Yeah, it looks good. Okay, great. Um, okay, well, thanks so much for inviting me to be here today and for being here to listen to me talk. Um, my name is Sarah Dryhurst. I'm based at the Winton Centre for Risk and Evidence Communication at the University of Cambridge. And the Winton Centre is a philanthropically founded centre that tries to help people who are making important decisions get access um, to the facts and the evidence that they need in as clear and as balanced a way as possible. And the aim of our communication is to inform, but not to persuade. So I'm going to talk to you today about communicating uncertainty. But actually, I wanted to start my talk with a news article, which is from the BBC, from a couple of years back when they were reporting on some ONS unemployment statistics. And the headline to this article reads, UK unemployment falls to 1.44 million. And then underneath, Underneath that headline, it says UK unemployment fell by 3,000 to 1.44 million in the three months to November, official figures show. But the question is, did it? Well, if we go to the ONS website and we go to the labour market survey from January 2018, which is what that article was based on, in the quality and methodology section, we find a paragraph that contains a very important sentence. And that sentence says, there was a small fall of 3,000 with a 95% confidence interval of plus or minus 77,000. Plus or minus 77,000. So when employment might have gone up, it might have gone down, we simply cannot tell. And so the uncertainty around this figure was key to the story and how much faith we should put in it. Think about a decision that you're basing on the facts put before you. You need to know how much to trust each fact. If it's an estimate, you need to know how certain we are about that estimate if you're to make a decision on it. So the question for all of us then is, you know, should we as communicators be upfront about communicating our uncertainties about something? Well, consider this communication of uncertainty, which is the forecast for Hurricane Dorian that struck the United States in autumn of last year. And this is the cone of uncertainty used to communicate the path of the hurricane. And you'll see it in various forms all over the media. 
So I have a question for you now, and I appreciate participation is tricky in a virtual setting, but you can think the answer to yourself at least. Um, if you were in Orlando, Florida right now, and you saw this forecast, would you evacuate? So you lived in Orlando, you turn on the TV, and you see this forecast. Do you choose to evacuate? Well, when people were asked this question, 40% said they wouldn't feel threatened if they lived just outside of the cone. But actually, if you speak to the hurricane forecasters, they expect the path of the hurricane to lie within the cone only 60 to 70% of the time. So one in three times the hurricane will hit an area outside of the cone. So clearly, people are fundamentally misinterpreting this communication. It's not a good method for communicating uncertainty. The one thing it is good for, however, is making it clear that uncertainty communications do need to be empirically evaluated. So the next question is then, how can we go about doing that? Well, I think it's useful first to set uncertainty communication within a framework. And this was one that was developed by some of my colleagues at the Winton Centre. And this framework first addresses who is communicating the uncertainty. So is it the people assessing the uncertainty in the first place? Um, they're usually experts of some kind, maybe an individual scientist or a scientific group like the IPCC or National Statistical Organization like the ONS. Or is it the people who are actually doing the communication? So communication professionals, journalists, maybe um, press officers acting on behalf of institutions. So the framework then considers what is being communicated. So what, what is the object about which there is uncertainty? Is it a fact? Is it a number? Is it a model or a scientific hypothesis? And what's the source of our uncertainty? So what are the reasons for our lack of knowledge? And then we need to think about what the level of the uncertainty is. So do we have direct uncertainty about a number, direct statistical uncertainty? Or is it more indirect uncertainty to do with the quality of the underlying evidence? And of course, we need to think about the magnitude of the uncertainty as well. So do we just have a small lack of precision or do we actually have a substantial degree of ignorance about something? So next, we need to consider what the form of the communication is. So firstly, how are we going to express the uncertainty? Because there are lots of different ways of doing that. We might use a full probability distribution or we might use something as simple as just a brief verbal mention that uncertainty exists. And what's the format of the uncertainty communication? Um, so will we use numbers or visualizations like the cone of uncertainty that you saw before? Or will we just use simple verbal statements? And of course, what's the medium? And the medium and the format will, will um, influence each other, of course. So are we using an app? Are we using a print-based format? Is it a website, a radio broadcast, or even verbal conversation? So once we've thought about who communicates what in what form, we crucially need to think about to whom, who are our audience, what are their characteristics in terms of their levels of graphical literacy, say, if you're using a visualisation, or their levels of numeracy, their knowledge about the subject that you're, you're trying to communicate, so their expertise. And what's the relationship of the audience to what is being communicated? Is the topic contested? Is it emotionally laden? Because that will affect how they perceive the information. And in a similar vein, what's the relationship of the audience to who is doing the communicating? So is there perceived credibility there? Is there trust or distrust between the audience and the communicator? Because again, that could influence their perceptions of what you're trying to communicate. And of course, once we've thought about who communicates what, in what form and to whom, crucially, we need to think about to what effect. What are the effects of our uncertainty communication on our audience? So what are their effects on their cognition? So how they perceive the information, how they understand it, their emotions, their level of trust or distrust in the information and ultimately their behaviour and decision making. And actually, it's concerns about these effects. So things like uncertainty might undermine people's understanding of the information that we're trying to communicate. It might reduce trust in the information or even undermine the quality of an individual's decision making. It's these kinds of concerns that often deter communicators from being upfront about uncertainties. But the question is, is there any evidence for these effects? And are there certain ways of communicating uncertainty that are better than others in terms of their influence on an audience? We'll consider this representation of a point estimate, um, such as a mean value and its associated uncertainty. Uh, it's a bar chart with error bars. I'm sure you will have seen them plenty time over. And this particular graph shows the average amount of snowfall expected in two hypothetical cities, city A and city B, and the 95% confidence interval associated with that mean value.
So effectively, there'll be lots of different predictions for the amount of snowfall expected in each city, but what the mean value provides you with is the most likely outcome that we expect. It's a representation of the underlying data. It's, it's a model. But of course, it is just that. It's a representation. So not all values in the underlying data will equal the mean. And the outcome that we actually see won't necessarily equal the mean either. So some values will be above the mean and some will be below it. So the 95% confidence interval around that mean tells us where 95% of the time the true value for the actual amount of snowfall will lie. So for this example, our most likely expected value is, is our mean at 60 millimetres, but it could be as high as, as uh, 75 millimetres or as low as 45 millimetres according to that 95% confidence interval. But the crucial thing to note about the confidence interval is that points that are equidistant from the mean in either direction are equally likely to occur. But that's the point that people don't understand about this representation. So they fall foul of what we call within the bar bias, where they think that values that lie within the bar and below the mean are much more likely to occur than points that are equidistant from the mean but above the bar. So it's almost like they think that that bar encapsulates all the important information and they ignore anything outside of it. So that's a fundamental misunderstanding. And I think it's something to bear in mind if you're thinking of using this kind of representation uh, to communicate um, uncertainty going forward. So the question is then, are there any alternatives to this approach? Well, one alternative that I'm sure many of you will be familiar with is what we call a violin plot. And again, with the violin plot for these two hypothetical cities, we have the mean shown, the most likely value for each city. But actually, it, it gives you a representation of the underlying data around that mean value. So if you imagine all the raw data values plotted out, most of them will cluster around the mean. They're the most likely values. But there'll also be fewer values or certain values that will be a little bit further away. And they're less likely, but still possible. So it gives you that nice representation of the underlying data and the uncertainty around that mean. And actually, when these types of graphs have been evaluated, they've been shown to be understood very well. And it seems that people don't seem to fall foul of that within the bar bias. So they seem to understand the points that are equidistant um, from the mean in either direction are indeed equally likely to occur. So another um, possible representation that you could use is something called the hypothetical, hypothetical outcome plot. And I'm not sure whether this, this is actually going to animate properly. Hopefully it is. Um, but what you can see um, on the left in the static graph is two blue lines which represent the means of these two groups again, A and B, and the 95% confidence interval around that. And what the hypothetical outcome plot on the right does, and hopefully it's uh, animating through this now, is the blue line actually cycles through all the possible values um, that A and B could actually take. So all the possible or all the underlying um, data points. So it gives you, again, a sense of the spread of the underlying data and the uncertainty around um, our mean value. And you can see most of the time the blue lines do tend to cluster around the mean because that's where most of the underlying values are. But sometimes they jump much higher or jump much lower to show you that there are these more extreme values that are less likely but still possible. So as I said, I think it gives you that really nice representation um, of the uncertainty around, around our, our, our mean values. And actually, again, when they've been evaluated, they've been shown to be understood well. And actually, these plots are particularly good for communicating differences between two different groups. So people seem to be able to judge accurately whether or not there's a difference between um, two groups using these sorts of charts better than they can using the bar chart representation from before, but, but even than using the violin plot, in fact. But of course, we can't always use an animated graphic um, in, our, in our publication. So are there any static alternatives? Well, if we return to our geographical data from before and um, our dreaded cone of uncertainty still here on the left, what you can see on the right is um, a representation where all the possible paths that the hurricane could take, all the hypothetical outcomes effectively have been plotted out. So it's kind of like a static representation of that hypothetical outcome plot. And you can see um, the, the trajectory of the hurricane, the most likely trajectory is still within this region of the cone of uncertainty where most of the outcomes have been plotted. But actually, it also shows you um, that these trajectories, these more random trajectories are, are possible. They're less likely, but they're, they're, they're still possible. Um, so it gives that nice representation of the uncertainty again. And actually, when it's been evaluated, it's been shown that people comprehend this representation much better than they do the cone of uncertainty. And the quality of their decision making, in fact, is also um, 
far better. The question is now, I mean, I've talked about point estimates with uncertainty around them. I've talked to some extent about geographical representations of uncertainty. But what about when we're communicating uncertainty about facts or numbers in text? Uh, so we might be writing a report or a journalistic article where we can't have loads of graphics in there. We simply just want to state a number and the uncertainty associated with it. So perhaps the estimate for net migration for a particular month in time or for unemployment for a particular point in time. So how does communicating uncertainty around these facts and numbers work? Well, actually, this is something that the Winton Centre have looked at specifically. So we wanted to evaluate, as I said, how presenting numbers, how presenting uncertainty, sorry, around these kinds of static numbers, these standalone numbers, affects people's interpretation of them. So we took a large sample of the UK public and we showed them one of eight different uncertainty formats embedded in a news article about unemployment. And these uncertainty formats were of three broad types. So we had a control group where the article contained a sentence that simply said unemployment fell by 116,000. And then we had a variety of numeric representations of uncertainty. So the uncertainty was expressed in some kind of numeric format, like plus or minus 99,000, or um, the article stated unemployment fell by 116,000, ranged between 17,000 and 215,000, so. And then we had a variety of verbal representations of uncertainty as well. So the uncertainty here was expressed with a verbal qualifier, but with no actual numeric quantification. So we trialed simply using the word estimated, to convey that concept of uncertainty. And then we had a more explicit uncertainty statement, said there's some uncertainty around this figure, it could be somewhat higher or lower. And then a more implicit uncertainty statement where we talked in terms of ranges rather than uncertainty explicitly. So once people had seen one of these different formats, we asked them various questions. Firstly, to get at if they understood what that uncertainty information actually meant. So if those people who saw the article that expressed uncertainty actually perceived those numbers as being less certain, than those people who were given no uncertainty information at all. But we also asked them questions to find out how much they trusted the information, how trustworthy they thought that information was. Um, so we wanted to get at there whether that concern that communicating uncertainty undermined trust, whether that was actually indeed um, the case. So what did we find in this study? Well, participants did perceive uncertainty when it was communicated to them in most numeric and verbal formats. So they understood what that uncertainty information actually meant. Although there was one exception, and that was where the word estimated was used. And I think this is actually a really important take home point. So for people who saw the statement unemployment fell by an estimated 116,000, they didn't rate that statement as being any less certain than people who were given no uncertainty information whatsoever. So I think if you are wanting to communicate uncertainty, if you are wanting to be upfront and transparent in these communications, simply using the word estimated is not going to do that. It doesn't seem to be a salient concept to people in terms of communicating uncertainty. So what about effects on trust? Well, some expressions of uncertainty did maintain trust in the numbers compared to the control. And that included our numerical range of the point estimate and also our implicit verbal statement as well. Although actually this study trialed lots more, um, in lots more experiments, trialed lots of different numeric versus verbal representations. And actually generally it's recommended that numerical representations are trusted more and they're also more precise, so they're less likely to be misinterpreted. So that's something to bear in mind. But in this section of the study, actually all of the uncertainty communication formats maintain trust in the source. Um, so not just in the data, but in the source of the data as well, compared to not communicating uncertainty. So I think those results are pretty encouraging. But the next question that we had was what about communicating uncertainty around trends? Because we're often trying to communicate trends, how things change over time. We might be uh, comparing between lots of different trends. And this is a little more complex. There's more information to process. So if you slap uncertainty over the top of that, is it just too much for people to handle? And do they lose trust in that information as a result? So this um, here is a chart that the BBC developed. Um, it's their poll tracker that shows the trend in uh, support for political parties in the UK. And this was something that we worked on with them in the build up to the general election last year. So you can see in this trend, um, you can see uh, the trend in, in party support for the Conservative Party, the trend in support for the Labour Party, the Liberal Democrats, Brexit Party, etc. 
Um, but of course, as you know, this trend is made up of lots of individual polling figures taken by different groups. And when you look at the variability in these individual polling figures that make up that trend, so effectively the uncertainty around the trend, things become a bit more complicated. And you probably feel differently now about the certainty of these trends having seen the second image. So we decided that we wanted to test the effects of presenting uncertainty around trends on people's understanding and again on their levels of trust to see if the results were similar to when we presented it around standalone numbers. And we did this for lots of different data sets. So the polling data that I've just shown you, but also some ONS net migration data, unemployment data. And more recently, we did a replication um, with some um, reported COVID-19 daily death data for Italy and the UK as well. So the other thing that we wanted to get at in this particular study was were there any advantages to communicating uncertainty? Because so far we've been saying communicating uncertainty doesn't undermine comprehension, communicating uncertainty doesn't undermine trust. So we're saying it doesn't do any harm compared to not communicating uncertainty. But actually, are there any benefits? Are there any positives to communicating uncertainty beyond not, not communicating it at all? And one such positive could be that it might give people more nuance in their interpretation of trends and potentially facilitate more informed decision making off the back of that. So to try and get at um, this idea, we asked people various questions in our COVID study, um, similar to this one. So the, the question was, what does this graph show about the death rate in Italy compared to the UK between day 12 and day 17 of the pandemic? Now, if you were to see um, this graph here on the left with no uncertainty, you can see that day 12 is here and day 17 is here. And it's this section of the graph here. And to me, at least, it looks pretty definitive that that yellow trend, which is the daily death rate in Italy, is definitively higher than the blue trend, which is the UK data. But of course, if I were to show you uncertainty around that information, if you were to, to see this graph or this graph here with the underlying data plots um, plotted out, then you might feel kind of differently about, about that assertion. You might hedge your bets a bit more in your answer to that question and answer less definitively. So effectively, you might have more nuance in your interpretation of that trend. And this is what we wanted to test in this study too, to see if people did indeed, when you show them that uncertainty, have more nuance in their interpretation. So what did we find here? Well, presenting uncertainty around trends, again, didn't compromise participants' objective comprehension. So they seem to be able to use those graphs just as well to answer questions and make inferences when you showed them the uncertainty information as when you didn't convey that information at all. And again, presenting uncertainty didn't undermine perceptions of trustworthiness of the data or indeed of trustworthiness of the data producers. And positively, there was some indication indeed that uncertainty gave increased nuance to people's interpretations of trend lines. So actually, I think these results are quite encouraging and, and they show that perhaps we can be more muscular in our presentation of, of uncertainty going forward, provided, of course, the effects of our communications are evaluated. So we don't end up with the cone of uncertainty disaster that we saw at the beginning of the talk. So I wanted to leave you just with one final thought, and that's that there's more than one type of uncertainty. So there's uncertainty that's directly about the object of communication, such as the statistical ranges that we've just been discussing. But of course, there's a form of indirect uncertainty as well, which is more to do with how sure we are about the quality of the underlying evidence upon which our assessments are based. So that might be to do with what's the level of expert agreement or disagreement about a particular thing. Or it might be if there have been several studies looking at the effect of something, say the size of the effect of a particular drug, do they agree in their estimated effects or do they disagree? And actually, just continuing with that example quickly, so there may be one study that estimates the size of an effect of a drug and it shows a very positive effect. And it also shows that there's a very small confidence interval around that estimated effect size. So what effectively they're saying is we're pretty damn certain that the effect of this drug is going to be this. But what if I told you that the quality of the underlying methodology of that study was poor, or that the data quality was poor, or perhaps that several other studies had attempted to replicate that effect and come to quite divergent conclusions? You probably feel differently about the quality of that evidence. And you certainly want to know that information before you made a decision about prescribing that drug or taking that drug. So I think that really brings home this idea that we need to be upfront too about communicating this other type of uncertainty, this indirect uncertainty about the quality of evidence.
But we do also need to be careful in our communications of this other type of uncertainty as well. Because again, if we're not careful and we don't evaluate it, then it can lead to misperceptions. And I'll leave you with one final story, uh, which is a classic in the tabloids. I'm sure you will have seen it before. And the headline reads, cancer danger in bacon. Eating processed meat is as bad as smoking. And as I said, it's a classic. And it stems from a confusion about this other type of uncertainty, this uncertainty about the quality of the underlying evidence. So in this case, the International Agency for Research on Cancer were rating the level of certainty or the quality of the evidence about how carcinogenic different things were. And they put cigarettes and bacon in the same category when it comes to the quality of evidence, but crucially, not in the same category when it comes to the size of their effects, i.e. how carcinogenic they are. So the distinction is that we are as sure that bacon has a tiny influence on your cancer risk as we are sure that cigarettes have a huge effect. So the quality of the evidence is the same, but the size of that effect is different. So I think this really hammers home this point that we need to be very clear about our communication of this other type of uncertainty, this indirect uncertainty about the quality of the underlying evidence, as well as we do about our direct statistical uncertainties that I was discussing earlier in the talk. So I'll leave it there for now. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Sarah. Um, there's a couple of questions for you. So do you think violin plots and hypothetical outcome plots are simple enough for lay users of statistics to understand? Yeah, I think I think that's a good question. And actually, so with the violin plots, the, the studies that, that were done on those were with the public audience, this particular study at least that I was I was referring to, and they did seem to understand it pretty well. Um, I think I think that is, I suppose there, there are probably two levels of understanding. It's, it's it, you know, some people will have a more detailed understanding of it, but actually, even if people are just coming away with a kind of gist representation in their head of what the uncertainty is, which I think is part of the value of that violin plot, that can be um, useful enough, at least for, for a public audience um, uh, to, to take away. Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously, I think in any in any situation, um, you need to try and evaluate the the communications that you're using. But but I think violin plots can be can be a nice way of, of representing that data. Great. Um, another question. Sorry if I mispronounce this reference, but are you aware of Anna Galevo's work in the Economic Statistics Center of Excellence, also studying public relations to methods of communicating uncertainty? I'm not, but I probably should be. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll have to look her up. So I'm more on the psychology side. And sometimes, unfortunately, there can be a bit of a divide between psychologists and economists. Um, so, um, so, yeah, no, I'll be, I'll gladly. I can send you that reference. Um, yeah, thank you. When, thank you. Louise, when that reference was going through, when that paper was going through refereeing, I know that David Spiegelhalter was one of the people named as commenting on it. So it does link up. So maybe David's probably will be aware of it then, especially if you know he was he was connected to, to the review. But I'm I haven't read it, so I'll have to have a look. Thank you for that. Great. I think that's all the questions we've got for that presentation. So thanks very much, Sarah. Thank you. Um, I'd like to invite Jonathan from DFB to talk about assessing and communicating uncertainty toolkit. Hi there, can you can you hear me, Louise? Yeah, can hear you fine. And can you see my screen? Yes, yeah. Great. OK, um, so I do have uh, a PowerPoint pack to go alongside this, um, which I'm sure will be sent round afterwards. Um, but I am actually going to talk through using the the website toolkit that um, that I've been working on with other analysts across government and the academic community. So I'm just going to give a very sort of brief background as to as to how this came about uh, and and what it is, uh, who should be using it, uh, engaging it, and how um, the analytical community can indeed help to improve it. Um, so, like, yeah. Brief, brief history is that this this toolkit, uh, this website that you see in front of you here, um, came came about as a real kind of bottom up driven movement from um, analysts kind of connected across different departments, who felt that there were 
excellent guides already out there. I think we've we've seen uh, evidence of that in the presentations today already. Um, so, for example, Charles's um, GSS external sort of presentation focused guidance. Um, but what we what we really wanted to do was bring something uh, into a very kind of um, government decision making around uncertainty context and think through the kind of whole journey. So we found there were lots of really useful things that we've tried to kind of point towards on presenting and communicating uncertainty. Um, but but there was less out there in the kind of stages before that, which I'll which I'll talk through. Um, and that's what that's what we've tried to do. So this has been a real kind of collaborative uh, effort. Um, nearly every government dep department has been involved and associated um, associated groups like the government actuarial department. Uh, we've had people from ONS, uh, Charles indeed, on the, on the working group uh, and many, many others. We're also um, multi-profession. So we have um, statisticians, operational researchers, economists, and and social researchers who've who fed into the the thinking behind this. Um, so yeah, a real kind of um, collaborative uh, effort. Um, yeah. So coming into the the toolkit, the URL is uh, is there for anyone who's following live and wants to open open it up. Um, so I think as uh, there's many analysts working in government on this on this call. Um, I think we all know that uncertainty is something that's unavoidable in the uh, in the analysis we produce, and we want to conduct our analysis in a way that takes uncertainty into account, and then communicate those results in a way that ensures that the decision maker can understand the nature of the uncertainty in the situation they're facing, and understands the nature of the results given the underlying uncertainty, and then factor that into uh, into their overall decision of which uh, analysis and the uncertainty around that analysis uh, will will be uh, will be some part of. So that's what the that's what the toolkit is all about. Uh, in terms of navigating the the toolkit, um, so yeah, we've we've built this using like a book down format. It's called so yeah. There's the there's the bar across the top which takes you through the different sections. I'm going to walk uh, quickly through and give you a whistle stop tour of those today. And then on uh, on most of the individual sections, there's also a menu bar on the on the left hand side. We've used a words in tables format. So for those who are wanting to get to something quickly, you can you can scan through headings on the left hand side, which should give you a feel of what's going on in the more kind of detailed information uh, to the right of, of that. Um, yeah, and we have a we have a, an email address. Uh, it's connected to the to the Home Office at the moment, but we um, we deal with those as a as a working group. Uh, and while I'm going through this, we're always um, always open to getting fresh faces involved in the in the working group. So um, yeah, if you're if you're interested in uh, in this collaborative project, which has been been really fascinating to be involved in, then uh, do get in touch either with with me or um, via this this email address here. So moving on to the um, introduction. Um, so in yeah, on, on, on this page, um, yeah, you know, we talk about uncertainty being unavoidable. We try to bring an example in straight away. Um, so I think one of the previous presenters talked about uh, rainfall. We talk about flooding risk here using an example from the, the, the USA around predictions uh, that didn't fully take into account uh, the actual uncertainty. So there was a, a an estimated um, prediction of like 49 feet being sufficient. Um, there was a bit of margin built in, so the um, the levees were built to handle a flood of fifty one feet, but the actual flood was was fifty four feet. So had the com had the uncertainty, which is actually plus or minus nine feet, been uh, been communicated effectively, uh, obviously lots of lots of damage, uh, both kind of monetary and like the impact that it has on people could have been uh, avoided. Um, so yeah, we cover that that uh, example quickly, and then the this kind of cycle um i'll describe it as that we go through are covered across um sections two three four and five so i'll just talk about this this cycle briefly before going into it in a little bit more detail um i think i'm sure 
that as many analysts who are on this call will appreciate that these kind of cycles and, and ideas about how analysis plays out and the interaction with uh, policymakers, decision makers plays out. Uh, it's not always cyclical. There's, there's stages that are missed out, stages that are repeated. Um, but this, this is hopefully kind of a useful framework. So yeah, when we started putting together the toolkit, as I said, we were really kind of thinking about this section four, presenting and communicating uncertainty. But then we realized that there's quite a few things that take uh, place or should take place before uh, before we get to that point. So the first kind of uh, point is around jointly agreeing how uncertainty should be used. So this is about having that upfront conversation with the senior responsible officer for the for the analysis um, and the policymakers and the analysts involved, asking them the question right at the start, when we've completed this analysis, what do you want to be able to say about uncertainty? Do you want to be able to express it in terms of a confidence interval? Do you want to say we have a 90% uh, a chance that the budget won't go above X billion pounds? What is it that you want to be able to say? And therefore we can factor that into the analysis that we design. So that's often a step that's kind of glossed, glossed over um, and uncertainty is kind of tacked on to the end of the sort of analytical process, um, often in a kind of simplistic way, rather than actually having that conversation and it being designed in and thought about throughout the process. So once that is done, then it's about, okay, what are the sources of uncertainty? Where do they come about? Can I quantify these uh, in, in any kind of meaningful way? Um, then once we've, once we've done that, okay, so we've got, some, uh, we've got some uncertainties. How do we kind of understand and measure these? Uh, what techniques can we use? And then it's the, the section on presenting and communicating uncertainty. So that's, that's kind of the, the cycle. Um, and then after that, there's a kind of conclusion. We have some case studies, uh, which we're always looking to build up. So like really keen for if people want to get some of their work um, that's not kind of uh, sensitive, you know, can be aggr aggregated um, as, as you wish out there on the on the World Wide Web, then that would, that would be great. We've got four at the moment, but always looking to bolster that. Um, we're always looking to kind of join up with different bits of work and organization. So we cite sources throughout, but we also have some further reading. We have a summary for the decision makers. So this is, I should have said a bit earlier, this is largely targeted at analysts uh, and how the analyst should interact with the decision maker and with the uncertainty. Um, but uh, we also want to have something as a kind of, you know, what do we want the senior responsible officer to read? If they've got five minutes, we want them to go straight to this. So I will, uh, I will continue through. So jointly agreeing how the uncertainty should be used. So now you're starting to see this bar appear. I'll zoom in a little bit to make that a little bit clearer. Um, so yeah, you, you get a feel straight away for how the how the site's laid out. Uh, I'm just going to hide that. Um, yeah, you get you get that feeling straight away um, for and you know, that allows you to kind of jump to different sections quite nicely. Um, yeah, and this, this, as I said, is all about um, yeah having that discussion up front. Like, what's what's the real question here? Is it how much money is this new policy like to save, or is it how certain can we be that this policy would save more than X pounds? So it's about clearly defining the question and then the um, and then the uncertainty. And there's things as well that often get glossed over. Like, are we interested in uncertainty on a calendar year or financial year basis or an annual year? Um, what are those kind of important details that are going to inform this? Um, having the discussion at this point, how are the outputs eventually going to be used? What does the decision maker want to be able to say at the at the end of this? How does the analysis fit into the kind of bigger bigger picture? How influential is it? So like one of the kind of age old um, challenges to analysts in, in government and I'm sure beyond is uh, like pressure on our time and our resource. So if the um, if the outputs are only a very kind of small part of the overall decision making process, we probably don't want to be spending um, 
a hell of a lot of time building a really sophisticated Monte Carlo analysis that has uh, in, input distributions for every single um, every single data input in our model. Um, it's probably you know something more kind of proportionate might might do, and just focusing on some of the the key assumptions. And then also, are there like other downstream uh, models or pieces of analysis that are that are drawing upon upon the work that you're doing? Um, so. If your outputs are inputs to another piece of analysis, you need to make sure that that join up is going to going to work. Um, so, if you're feeding a Monte Carlo simulation, make sure that you feed it with something that can actually be usefully used. Um, yeah, we talk about the the, the timing um, as well, and uh, and how we can uh, make sure that we're um, we're providing what is needed at the right. Time, so it's better to do something that's kind of ninety percent good enough uh, in by Friday rather than something that's ninety nine percent good enough uh, on Friday week, for example. Um, talk about how you avoid misleading results uh, and how the uncertainty will inform the decision maker's judgment. So that's the that's kind of a, a helpful framework for thinking about that upfront um, conversation. So. Now we know what we want to do. We've got an agreement with our customer. We then need to try and define and identify the uncertainties. Um, uncertainties can um, can come about in, in lots of different ways. Some of these things you can quantify, some you can't, but early identification and capturing those uncertainties, that's, that's really, really important. Um, we talk in this table around like classifications of uncertainty, so it's kind of a useful um, useful tool for helping you think about those. So, um, aleatory uncertainty um, that might be something like throwing a, a fair dice, for example. Um, epistemic um, uncertainty, the the known unknowns, that might be throwing a dice that's um, loaded in some unknown way, so it's kind of biased in some kind of way towards um, particular numbers, and then unknown unknowns or ontological uncertainty that might be someone swapping the fair dice for a loaded dice without us even knowing that that was a possibility so yeah this is a kind of useful useful way to think about where different types of uncertainties can come from and then we go on to talk about sources of uncertainty um, which could be data that's the common way that we that we think about um uncertainty and like distributions of, of data um, assumptions so like where have we made simplifying assumptions models are all about simplifying the the, the real world um, so where have those assumptions brought about uncertainty can we um, even if we can't quantify those can we kind of rag rate those or we'll talk about them in a, in a qualitative sense and then the analysis itself um, and yeah, but one of the one of the things that can be done to reduce the uh, uncertainty in the analysis itself is having really good uh, analytical quality assurance practices. Uh, and we point out the Aquabook, um, which is a good a good reference for that. So we've defined those uncertainties, um, and then this is quite a uh, quite a chunky section. So I won't go I won't go through every technique that we um, that we cover in here. Um, but yeah, this this starts out by talking about how we might um, quantify uh, our uncertainty. It talks about things like discrete and continuous um, distributions. Um, confidence intervals, how we can use past model performance. Um, so how well did our model perform compared to outturn data? And how can that inf uh, inform the creation of input distributions for future um, pr pred predictions? projections um and then yeah we go go through different different options if we don't have um if we don't have distributions what can we do and how can we use expert judgment etc and then we go on to talk about a range a whole range of techniques so uh, it's we've called it common techniques um there's this is definitely not exhaustive uh and i think like in in seeing some of the other the other presentations, like having things like violin violin plots and the kind of interactive uh, interactive plots, I really liked I really like that i that idea. So this 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 is an evolving toolkit. 
it's it's version one uh, and we're looking to kind of improve and and add to it to make it more useful for people um yeah so we go through we go through the different techniques um for each of them we outline what the what the process is so just taking monte carlo at the top six step process for how you go about carrying out Monte Carlo. And then we try to kind of weigh up um, the advantages and why you might do this. And then some of the kind of disadvantages to kind of help inform the uh, the choice for the user. Um, and then for each case as well, we, um, we have a example. Um, so yeah, we do that for, I think about six or seven different techniques, um, there, but yeah, definitely, definitely scope for, for expanding that, but yeah, plenty to kind of get you, get your teeth into. So yeah, if you're, if you always kind of default to one particular technique, it, I do have a flick through this because it's useful just to know like what else is, what else is out there, um, and when, when and why it might be, might be useful. So yeah, there's plenty in there. And then just keeping an eye on time. I've got about five minutes, I think. Um, so on presenting and communicating uncertainty. So yeah, the the other some of the other talks have have covered this. Um, so I won't go as much into depth as I was maybe planning to. Um, as I've said throughout, we do try to point towards other guidance. So the GSS guidance that uh, that Charles ref Charles referenced that's cited right at the top there. Um, and yeah, we're always looking to point towards other other useful useful things. We're not trying to like rewrite other existing guidance that's that's out there. We want to we want this to be a kind of signposting um, a website as as much as uh, informative in in itself. Um, so yeah, at the top of this, we talk about deciding what to communicate um, and how we go about presenting caveats. Um, when we're talking about presenting and communicating in this, we try to cover both visual um, presentation and visual aids, um, but also we we do a little we do a little bit, and we've done some research on um, on verbal communication and how um, and how different uh, different choices of words can be perceived differently, and whether we whether we talk about being ninety percent confident about something or. Ten uh, or you know, flipping that on its head and saying uh, talking about the ten percent rather than the the ninety percent. So yeah, we we're ninety percent sure that the budget won't exceed a hundred billion. Sounds a bit different to we, we, there's a ten percent chance that um, that that it's going to uh, exceed hundred billion. So just thinking about like the messaging that you use. Should you use one of those? Should you use the other? Should you in fact use both? So we talk about that in this kind of communication basics uh, section and talk towards um, uh, and point towards different pieces of like relevant research uh, of which there is lots of excellent things out there. Um, so yeah, plenty in here. And then yeah, there's as you can see down the down the left, there's lots of different um, lots of different graphics that we've included. Um, and yeah, there's, there's there's definitely definitely scope in there to include some other ones because there's some really nice really nice stuff out there. Um, yeah, and I think in all of the cases we include uh, like a, a diagram uh, with with an example, um, as well as explaining um, what the technique tries to show. What, sorry, what the visual tries to show. Um, then, so that's the that's the cycle that I talked about. Um, there's a sort of very brief summary conclusion here. Um, Case studies, um, uh, yeah, another chance to plug that we're always on the lookout for for new case studies. So if you're able to get your case study into a format where you talk about a situation, what the approach was, and then going through our kind of four stages of the cycle, so asking the right, sort of sharpening the question, defining and identifying uncertainty, measuring that uncertainty, and then presenting it, um, that'd be really helpful. Um, so yeah, do do have a look at these uh, these different examples. They're um, they're all government ones at, at the moment. Um, we point towards some further reading. Um, so yeah, there's a there's a few in there which have informed some of what we've what we've pulled together. Um, but yeah, this is this is very much uh, very much version one. 
Um, and then we have a decision maker summary. So this this is something that um, you can use for the sort of point your decision makers towards, um, which includes that example from the from the start, which we think is quite a quite a powerful one, uh, and just kind of summarizes what like the real key key points and take homes are. Uh, I think I've got a minute left, so I'll just kind of say like where we're up to and what we want to do going forward. So the toolkit, as you can see, is published. This was published back in January. Uh, it's very much um, put out as version version one uh, and put out there to engage people. We're not presenting this as kind of a, a final like version of the truth, and it's out there to kind of complement other work uh, which is which has gone gone before it and and informed it. Um, we we have been working as well as with uh, government and arms length bodies and groups like INS. Um, we're in contact with uh, the academic community. So we, um, so Catherine Byrne, who's um, one of the sort of co-chairs of the of the working group. She's got good contacts at the Winton Centre. Um, we also have um, contacts at the Turing Group as well. So we've been we've been engaging the uh, different different groups and different communities to to make this the most useful tool that that it can be. So based on the kind of feedback that we've had so far, so we ran a we ran a survey over the the first kind of couple of couple of months following publication. Um, so one of the things we're trying to do is create more practical tools. So we um, we point out in the understanding and measuring uh, uncertainty, like how you go about doing Monte Carlo or how you go about focusing on dominant uncertainty. What we want to do is point towards like snippets of uh, R code, for example, that actually enable people to have a framework for, for doing this. Um, so that's something that people are keen to see and we are working on. Um, we want to increase the number of case studies, as I've said. The decision maker summary is really brief at the moment. We think we can add a little bit more in, into that to make it more useful. Um, in this technique section, there's there's definitely other techniques that we that we want to add. Um, obviously, there's there's probably like a, a sweet spot, so we don't want to list like every single technique. But I think I've seen in the other presentations today definitely definitely uh, scope for adding adding some in. So that's been that's been really useful. And we're also always looking to bring in wider perspectives. Um, so we've got a, like fairly diverse like analytical representation within within our group. But we've had comments from the likes of like the legal sector say like expressing like how they think about uncertainty so which we're trying to kind of weigh up whether there's without trying to get this tool to do everything for everyone and again it's about finding the right balance um yeah we are um we are very open to to different views so yeah happy to take any uh any questions that there are now um uh, and also yeah going forward like really really keen to to engage uh engage with the the community both within and outside of government uh, thanks for listening. Brilliant, thank you. Um, we shared the link in Slido so people have hopefully been able to um, have a look along with you and we'll share that in the email afterwards. Um, there's a question for you. Have you thought about how you might evaluate use or impact of the toolkit? Yes, uh, good, good question. We, so we have, um, I can share screen again briefly. So we didn't unfortunately get this ready in time for our launch, um, but since we have, um, so we now have, well, one way, one way of tracking this, which is we use Google Analytics. Um, so we've got a thing that pops up on the on the front screen that you see on basically every website you ever visit these days that says that your your usage of the site is being tracked. So we've got six active users on the page right now. Um, so yeah, this is this is going to be really helpful for us. So when we when we kind of launch version two, like having this in place will be will be really really handy um, and in terms of kind of state of the art tools. So yeah, we can actually like see the breakdown of exactly which pages people are on at, at the moment.
Um, and yeah, for those of you who use Google Analytics, you'll probably appreciate it. it's quite it's yeah it's really it's really handy for kind of building up a, a picture a picture over time. So yeah, that's that's one form of value evaluation. Um, we ran we ran a survey for the about like usefulness um, when we when we published the the first version. So um, yeah, we. And and the the email um, inbox has been has been like really useful for getting feedback, and we are genuinely using that feedback to inform the the direction of travel of the of the working group. Great, thank you. Um, there's no more questions there at the moment, um, so I'll invite Nikki to come back and close the session. Thank you all for um, joining us today. Um, I hope you all enjoyed. Also, special thanks to our presenters for the day. I hope you find the presentations um, really um, interesting. Just a sec, wrong, wrong slide. Uh, unfortunately, today there were some technical issues um, with the presentations. Um, Many people could not uh, join due to um, technical issues and restrictions of the stream. Um, however, a recording of uh, today's webinar is going to be shared um, on a YouTube channel and also it's going to be shared with everyone who uh, couldn't join uh, the webinar today. Uh, you can also find information and presentation slides and details of all the uh, webinars organized so far on the GSS website. Uh, you can also find details there for any upcoming uh, webinars. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can contact us on GSS Help. The next sharing webinar is going to be on statistical disclosure control around September. We are currently working on speakers and agenda, and we will confirm um, a date soon. Thank you all for today. <laughs>